five, four, three, two, one, and blast off! Welcome to the 70th episode of the Hug One Starter podcast, the podcast that talks about anything and everything related to the living and working in South Korea. Um, the only podcast, live podcast on YouTube, uh, streamed live from South Korea. That'll keep you busy for a while. Um, Today is Monday, the 29th of July, no, 29th of June, um, and on today's menu is a talk about um, how to handle disruptive students in, in an ESL classroom. Um, and we are going to look specifically at ESL classrooms um, because one of the things that we need to do first before we even start getting into the topic of uh, managing students and whatnot is, um, well, there are several things that we need to do, but uh, before we get to that, let's tune down the music uh, a wee bit so I can actually think and hear myself think. <laughs> um, Right, maybe I should switch the screens. Okay, there you go, here we go. Uh, see, it's been 70 episodes. Can you believe it? It's been 70 episodes and I still do goof-ups like that. Uh, I, I really need a manager or some, somebody at the, at the control uh, doing all these things. If you're looking for a volunteer job, uh, let me know. I'll hook you up with one. Um, welcome um, to another, to the 70th episode of the uh, Korea podcast, formerly known as the Hagwon podcast. Um, on today's menu, uh, how to handle disruptive students. Uh, this question was posted or asked, posted to me through the Shane uh, Hagwon uh, Korea, through the Shane English Korea Facebook group by a person who follows me through either through the Shane Korea, Shane English Korea or through the... Um, through the podcast. In any case, there were a couple of questions. This young man is striving to become an ESL teacher um, on his way. Uh, he's doing his TESOL degree or a TESOL certificate. And, um, and so he had two questions and I'm addressing one of them. The other question was how to teach um, possessives in a classroom setting. Um, and so just to briefly, I guess, make, uh, make that point, uh, the best way to do is to use props. And I think the example that he was given was actually, I don't, yeah, I don't have it up here, but, uh, um, um, yeah, this is his, this is hers. Uh, one of the quickest things that I could think of uh, of teaching is taking people's objects. So if you have in a classroom students of all ages and groups, um, uh, if you take their individual objects, one object from each student, mix them together and you could ask whose is this? Um, and the students will obviously point to, you know, to the other person or maybe the student who it belongs to will raise their hand and say, hey, it's mine. And so um, you could say, ah, it's yours. And then you could turn to your student and say, it's his or it's hers and so on. And, and then you would get to practice that with all your other students. This is the quickest thing that I could think of doing um, in that kind of setting. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty other ones. Um, I asked people to chime in to see if there was any other ideas on that topic. Um, I hope that some people will chime in um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of different ways. And if you just head over to, uh, Google, there is somebody in line. So Hyung Sup B612. Hello. Welcome. Uh, if you are new here, if you're new here, So Hyung, uh, uh, Song. sorry. So Hyung Song, I guess maybe, uh, you know, make sure to follow us, subscribe to the channel. Uh, and stick around, watch, watch its entirety, these videos. Um, but, so on the menu today, in this short episode, it's going to be another 30 minute. Um, we'll be talking about how to handle disruptive students. And so, I would like to uh, distinguish between, you know, the, the very broad area of how to handle students 
to I think the quite maybe smaller and more narrower one on how to handle students in an ESL classroom because I think um, that particular classroom will allow us to encounter a different type of student than you might in a public school you know over a very broad range of, of students um, and cultures and, and all that stuff so today we're just talking about or I'll be just I'll just be talking about how to handle disruptive students in an ESL classroom um, Right, okay, so there are certain points that I wanted to go over. I hope um, I can cram all of that into this very short segment. Um, I also have, so there's some of my ideas that I have from my experience over the past 15 years of teaching, um, some of the experiences that I've gathered, um, and I've also dug up a couple of articles. One is by, uh, published by Scholarly, um, and they live 25 sure fire strategies on how to um, effectively discipline uh, students or in, encourage a discipline in the classroom and then there's another article uh, through.co through through co never heard of it but I dug it up um, and I looked at it, it looked uh, interesting published last year anyway so we'll start with with my ideas and then we'll go over to the articles that I found so first thing we want to do is distinguish between temporary behavior and persistent problems um, and I, yeah, so, and I guess, I don't know, a question like that on how to deal with, with problematic students is, for me, it might appear like an easy question, or just do this or do that, but from my perspective, it's not that easy. There's a lot more that you need to take into account as a teacher um, in order to make life for yourself and for your students as easy and as comfortable and as accommodating as possible. So there's a lot of other things that you need to take into account before you start, you know, dishing out justice upon the masses. <laughs> Fear me, students. <laughs> um, temporary behavior, you know, like if you've got kids, so what I mean by that is if you have kids who misbehave today but are normally fine, then you know, that's that's one thing you got to keep in mind. But if there is a um, uh, persistent problems, if there are persistent problems, if there are students who always misbehave and, and have, you know, simply problems with s staying calm or, or behaving in class, then those are two different categories that you need to talk about. Um, temporary behavior can easily be managed. Um, persistent problems will be more difficult to manage. That's basically it, right? Because temporary uh, problems can be either managed with rewards, which I will go into in a little bit, um, and other things and with rules and, and guidelines. Um, persistent problems may, be more, may have more underlying, more deeper, more underlying um, issues that may need to be dealt with on a, on a different level and outside of the classroom, right? Uh, and so in this case, I think I'm, I will be talking about kids with ADD or perceived ADD or ADHD um, and possibly other mental difficulties or, or emotional difficulties. Um, as an ESL teacher, that is not something I think most of us are uh, readily equipped uh, to deal with or to, to work with. And so um, in such cases, I would recommend, you know, seeking outside help and not trying to deal with that or work with that on yourself. Sorry, I don't mean to sound like, don't deal with that. That just sounds so uh, forced. Uh, I don't want to deal with that, man. No, I mean, kids with uh, special needs obviously need special um, attention and it's not something that most ESL teachers are equipped to, to work with. So I think uh, we were distinguishing that. Uh, and I'll just talk about the... Um, the uh, temporary behavior, the stuff that's manageable, right? Okay, so here's some ideas. So first of all, communicate clearly with the student using understandable vocabulary. So if you are working in a um, ESL classroom, um, then obviously language is a barrier, will be a barrier. So when you are expressing or you're trying to get your students in line and trying to get them to follow you, then you need to make sure that they understand what it is that you expect them to do, what you expect of them. So um, you either need to have uh, the proper vocabulary in place, simplified enough for the students to follow, um, 
or just write out rules, write them on board. Um, uh, be firm and direct. So the best way of doing that is having a set of rules that that you always reinforce um, and maybe have them written down on the board. That's one of the things that we do here at Shane English um, at, at our Hagwan is, at least I do in my classroom and I think most of our teachers do it as well just for consistency sake because that also helps as well. If you're working in a uh, school environment it's good for all the teachers to have the same rules so that you know if students switch classrooms um, or switch teachers and then the same rules will apply across all the classrooms. So that's something to keep in mind as well when you're teaching in an environment where you, you know, teachers switch or, or students switch, classrooms switch. Um, but be firm and direct. So let your students know what it is exactly that you expect them to do and don't budge on it. Tell them this is what I want you to do and you need to do it, right? Uh, use your tone, the next step, use your tone of voice carefully, uh, screaming won't work. Um, when you talk to students, obviously you need to be firm but not angry. Um, you, need to, you need to establish yourself as an authority figure and, and basically have an authoritarian, I guess, approach. Um, but that also will depend on the students. Sometimes you need to, if you're working with children, children oftentimes do not necessarily know what the limits are or do not understand what is allowed, what is not allowed. Um, and so um, uh, they may simply need an explanation or be explained to. Uh, I've been in cases where I explained, I've got a class of kindergarten children and, and there's 10 of them and there is to be more coming soon, which is like, wow, okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, and they're kids, they're only seven years old and they need constant reminding. Uh, I've got reminders on the board and I always remind them. But so having these rules written on the board um, and going over them every single morning allows the children to know what the expectations are so that when the rules are broken all I need to do is basically just call out rule number one or um, you're doing this wrong or you're doing that wrong and the children know right away you know that they've gone over the line. So consistency is a very important thing um, as well as follow through. Um, hmm. Be rational and objective. Um, don't make, you know, crazy expectations. Like uh, little children, if they move around, they're obviously little. Um, you can't expect them to sit on their uh, quiche for like three hours straight. Um, and we're looking at, you know, I've got kids coming in here and all hug ones all, all across Korea. Um, all the children study at schools. Their parents expect them to do homework. There's very little time to play. And then when they come to the hug one, they've got energy pent up um, and then they're expected to sit around more and do more book work. So um, what we try to do here at, uh, at the Hagwan is at our Hagwan is to implement games and activities which don't always work in our favor because like I said you know kids get wound up very easily and so it requires a lot more um, restraint and control. But, uh, so yeah, you, you can't expect children to sit for an hour straight um, and, you know, obey your, your every order and, and follow you to the T because they're kids. So be rational and objective. Um, always provide the time to listen to the student. Um, if you think, if there's, if there's an issue, if something happened uh, that is problematic, um, you know, if you can communicate with the students, then do. Find out what the problem is, find out why it happened, listen to the students, see what they have to say. Don't assume uh, because that could get you into some trouble, you know, on your part, because then you're not really sure how to handle the situation. Uh, and ignore trivial demands, uh, or sorry, ignore trivial denials. Not sure what that means, I think I got that off the internet. Uh, point number four, have clear expectations set out for all students. Um, so this is what I mentioned earlier. Um, I write these on my board. And so there's things like don't run in a classroom. Uh, don't climb on chairs. Uh, number three is speak English. Number four, don't speak Korean. And then five, I added don't run out of the classroom. So I have these rules on the board 
um, so the children can see them every day and they know what I expect from them. So if they break these rules, um, you know, I can use the reward system uh, to kind of, you know, let them know that they're not supposed to be doing it. So, um, right. Uh, number five would be start your class with an established ru uh, routine to allow students to set expectations. So at, um, at every beginning of the class, you should have a routine of doing things. First of all, it's very important for kids to have a routine. All children need a routine. They need to know what's happening. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times that kids, you know, uh, that I assigned uh, a task and immediately, there's always some children who finish quicker, some children finish slower. Um, and there is always a couple of kids who finish quicker. And the first question is, teacher, what do I do next? Um, so first of all, it would be good to have an additional activity for that because kids who, you know, excel at the activities that you provide them with will want to do more and will get bored while you wait for those students that are slower. Um, so you might want to have an additional activity, something to give to the kids that are faster. Um, but, um, where was I with this? Um, but yeah, but, but routines are important. So have a routine at the beginning of the class. It gets the kids in the mood. Um, things like, you know, talk about the rules, um, expectations so that if there, um, is, misbehavior that occurs in your classroom from from students then you can use those rules to to kind of manage and control the classroom um, yes 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 i hope that makes sense so far so far so good you with me everybody okay good uh, the next point is have a reward system in place. And so this is kind of important and it makes a huge difference on uh, your student's behavior. It will. Uh, in the past, we have used a reward system and it works beautifully. It's not flawless. Um, it's not a hundred percent foolproof. There are always, you know, problems and, and uh, shortcomings of it. But if you do have a reward system, whatever it is, there's, there's a plethora of these things out there and you can always come up with your own um, it will make life a wee bit easier or maybe even a lot easier. Um, all students want to have something to work towards. Um, you know, for little kids, there is, for, for the most, for most of them, um, there is no satisfaction in learning English, you know, for the sake of learning it. Uh, that's, that's the main difference between adults and kids, I think. If, you know, if there are any other differences, uh, this is probably one of the most important ones. Adults, when it comes to learning English, languages rather. Um, adults learn languages with a purpose. We have a goal, like I wanna, you know, I need it for my job, I need to write my letters, I need to be able to communicate with my friends or whatever. I'm trying to, to get a, a better a job, I'm hoping to travel abroad. But for kids, Kids don't have these goals. There are very few kids who have a goal like, oh, I want to read books in English or I want to you know, understand uh, lyrics in, in English songs. I think these things come on later in life. For the little ones, the elementary school kids, there is no such thing. They don't have these goals. So uh, when you tell them that uh, you, know, you should learn English because it's good for you, kids don't respond to that because they don't really know what that means. So you need to have some kind of reward in place that will allow the kids to want to study. Um, and so one of the things that, that we do here or what I do in my classes is I split them into two groups and if there's any activities um, or even if there is reading books, I mean, you can turn anything into an activity, right? Even reading books. Um, if you get students from each team to read, you can award or reward, you can award, award rewards. You can give rewards uh, to, to the individual groups for reading. Uh, well or not reading or not wanting to read like you know if you have a reading and there you get the kids to read sentence by sentence and then one team's kind of messing about and not following along then you can tell them sorry points go to the other team um, so you could have points during the classroom um, divide the board into two two separate parts and give each team scores and at the end 
you could um, provide them with a some kind of um, reward system. So what we used to do in the past, what we were implementing, haven't so far since the whole Corona nonsense, everything kind of way went haywire. Um, but we need to implement it again, and we will, is Shane Shiners. So we've got these little coupons that the kids can collect at the end of the class if they follow the three rules of, you know, listening to teachers, um, uh, speaking a lot of English, not speaking Korean, which is, you know, kind of inclusive, exclusive two points, um, uh, and, and doing your, your work, right? Um, and at the end of the class, you will be rewarded with a Shane Shiner. They can then collect these Shane Shiners, um, and exchange them for goods and services, not services, for goods at uh, uh, monthly or bi-monthly um, market day. Uh, so you can have points, stars, and coupons. I would say that having that uh, throughout the class, have either a reward system points, point system, and just basically give each team's points, um, and then at the end of the class, you know, reward them with like a, a smaller reward based on the points that they've collected over the, the period of class. If you have smaller classes of make, say maybe four or two students, um, then obviously you can do it individually. But if you have larger classes of eight students or above, then I would suggest just split them up into groups uh, because it's just easier and then uh, oftentimes in the groups, when there is a student who's kind of messing about um, or mucking about, that's, I like that phrase, mucking about. Hey man, stop mucking about, you bringing us down, boy. The whole team is losing points because of your mockery. Whatever. Uh, then you can have that kid um, on guard um, and, you know, all, all his little buddies are going to keep him or her in check because nobody wants to be... Um, you know, nobody wants to have that on their on their chest, right? Being the black sheep of the of the thingy majiggy, the thingy majiggy. Okay, some tunes are in order. We're good for some tunes. Um, okay, so that's it. That's coupons. Uh, and then number seven is try to steer clear of punishment or negative punishment. So uh, meaning like, you know, don't... Um, the stuff I learned in behavioral psychology, which is a very fascinating field of uh, educational psychology. Uh -huh. But there are different ways of, of rewarding and punishing. And there is positive and there is negative punishment. Um, negative punishment is where you basically take things away and positive punishment is where um, you don't give stuff that was promised type of deal. So try to steer clear from taking um, rewards away. Uh, and I would, yeah, I would put that at the end of it. So I guess if you have coupons that you want to give at the end, um, and in the meantime, in order to get those coupons, students have to collect stars or points, then I would say you can take away um, the coupons, uh, sorry, the, away the points. And so they could gain more points and lose more points. And maybe based on the number of this, the, po the points, they could uh, receive more of the coupons at the end of the class. So let's say like, you know, there are three rules and the kids follow all three rules. They will receive one coupon at the end of the class. That's kind of like a given, right? But let's say that a kid goes out of their way and does, you know, additional work extra to to what's expected of them, then you can give him one more. So instead of one, they will get two, two coupons or whatever, two tokens. But if they're just, you know, really mocking about and like they don't follow you at all, they're, they're disruptive in class and then like you're pulling your hair out and you're losing your mind and you're trying not to like physically pick the kid up and, and get yourself into some major trouble. Um, if that's the case, then basically that would, the last resort would be just to take away the punishment, uh, to take away the, the reward, and then you've got like the negative punishment, right? Um, and then the final point I wanted to make is a certain that the student isn't simply overly enthusiastic, right? Um, Keep in mind that the younger audiences, uh, the kids, oftentimes want to shout out, shout out, uh, particularly the, the little ones, like seven years old, um, even eight year olds, 
um, I still teach and eight-year-olds are still in the mind frame of the selfish indulgence of me, me, me. And so oftentimes these little buggers are not really clued in to the, to the outside world. Um, they're not really clued in yet to the fact that there are other people with other ideas and, um, you know, you have to teach them uh, to respect their friends and raise your hands. That's another thing. That's another way of, of managing behavior. Uh, you have to teach kids how to basically, um, how to behave in your classroom. Um, if you don't want kids shouting left and right, then you need to tell them very clearly. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand. Don't shout out, raise your hand and I will ask you. Um, and you have to be consistent and persistent in that. And it's an ongoing process. You have to do that. But, um, there are children who will always want to say stuff and they forget basically that, you know, there are other people in the room and they will just shout things out. So, um, just keep in mind that maybe they don't necessarily mean or intend to be mean. Uh, Joe says, hey Joe, Joe is here. Welcome Joe. Joe says, yes, the whole school, same rules. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying. So like if you have rules um, and all the teachers, then it would be good for all the teachers to follow the same rules. Um, so that, you know, there's consistency and all the kids can do the same things. They know what to expect in every classroom from every teacher. Um, so keep in mind that children that are like more enthusiastic um, and they maybe just want to talk more or maybe their English is a little bit better and they keep shouting out because they want to speak English uh, more. Um, and so they're not intending to be mean, they're just, they just really want to talk. So keep an eye out for that. Um, it's something that, you know, you need to tune in as a teacher uh, you need to pay attention to and just kind of be in touch with, with that. So that's really it. Um, that's really it from my side. Uh, I would like to go over to the, the articles now. And, and there is a bunch of them. So I think I would like to start with the, with the points from Scholastic because it's, you know, it's a credible source. 100 Scholastic, I guess they're celebrating 100 years or something. Oh, it's not even visible on the screen. Okay, wait, I'm going to... Transition, baby. Yeah, there we go. Okay, 100 Scholastic. There we go. Uh, 25, oh, what happened? 25 fire strategies for handling difficult students. Here we go. You can breathe a sigh of relief now. Here's expert advice on what to do when students act up and personalize clash. Uh, personalities clash. I can't read it. All right, so keep in mind, like I've read over these um, and they are aimed at teachers in general. They're not specific to ESL classrooms. Teaching in ESL classrooms is very different from teaching in public schools. I've spent um, uh, close to a year teaching in the public education system in England and boy oh boy was it very different. Uh, the students are different, the stuff, you know, the just just handling the whole situation is very, very different. It doesn't compare to an ESL classroom. Um, so some of these points are aimed at general classrooms rather than just ESL classrooms, but they're still applicable. So the ones that are inapplicable, we'll skip over uh, or we'll see if we can kind of simplify them for the ESL classroom. Take a deep breath. So the worst for first one is take a deep breath and try to remain calm. Um, if, if students bounce around too much, then yeah, no point in getting angry. Um, I know from my, my own experience, uh, because anger gets you nowhere. Uh, it can just, you know, it's, it's, it's not healthy for anyone. It's natural to be overcome with frustration, resentment and anger. But when you are, you become less rational and your agitation becomes contagious. Um, yeah, uh, just, just keep in mind the fact that you are the teacher, you're the adult uh, and you don't want to get wound up by children, uh, basically, you know, because um, because, because they're kids. So you need to be the rational person and you need to stick to your guns. Um, and you know, don't get drugged down to their level cause you know the saying, right? Anyway. Okay. Uh, the second one is try to set a positive tone and model an appropriate response. Even if it means you must take a few moments to compose yourself. If there is stuff 
um, you know, that happens occasionally, then yeah, uh, slow the class down and just, you know, compose yourself um, and just make sure that the student knows what the expectations are and yada yada. Um, if, if the behavior is, you know, repetitive and reoccurring despite the efforts that you put in to calm it down, then um, I would say take it outside, take it to a higher level, take it to a higher power, uh, involve the director or another teacher or, um, you know, you might have to um, deal with it in a different way. Uh, I personally have not really encountered too many occasions like that in which I had to escort my student in the ESL classroom. Like I said, in England, when I was teaching, it was very different. There were plenty of these occasions and it was just like, Bleh, what's going on? Why am I doing, what am I doing here? But with an ESL classroom, you will very rarely encounter things like that. Um, but if you do, then yeah, I would say you need to involve somebody, just make sure that, to notify, I guess, um, uh, another teacher and possibly school director if necessary, right? Acknowledge that you need time to think, time to respond. This is upsetting me too, but I need a few minutes, okay. Number three, make sure students understand that it's their misbehavior you dislike, not them. I like you, Jason, right? Now your behavior is unacceptable. Um, yeah, uh, so when I, so one of the things that's good is, you know, having rules written down. So the kids know what their class rules are. So kids come in every morning, we greet, we say hello, everything's hunky-dory, we're friendly, chitter-chatter, um, but then kids will start running around and then I can just say, please don't run around. And I always try to use please and thank you um, because I'm Canadian and we're all polite Canadians are, aren't they, eh? That's right. <laughs> And so, um, yeah, just let the kids know that the behavior is not acceptable and then, you know, don't alienate them. Um, yeah. Next one, give the misbehaving student a chance to respond. Um, oftentimes, you know, kids say, in, in my case with the seven-year-olds in kindergarten, they say, yes, teacher, okay, teacher, um, so they know that I understand and I know they understand and, and there you go. Um, never resort to blame or ridicule. Uh, avoid win-lose conflicts. Yeah, don't get yourself into a situation where you have to argue with a student. Yeah, because that's one of the worst things you can do probably, especially when you're dealing with high schoolers or middle schoolers because the dynamic is very different um, and so Having set out rules, classroom rules and expectations is very important in this case. Uh, so if students overstep these expectations, you can just say, listen, I don't care what your excuse is, your behavior right now is unacceptable um, and we're not doing it, okay? Because it interferes with the class, it interferes with my work here, what I'm doing, and it interferes with other students' ability to, to study, to learn, right? When you're being a, a goof. So having the simple rules written out somewhere for the students to be able to see um, makes a world of difference. Uh, assist that students, insist that students accept responsibility for their behavior. Um, you know, you don't have to, uh, you can explain it and, and say like, this is what you did wrong. Do you understand? Having the students say like, yes, I understand. That probably would be enough. Um, obviously, if there's like, you know, fighting or something, then in Korea in particular, you need to have students apologize. Students, even little kids, are very adamant about an apology. Um, they will themselves say, ask the other person to apologize. So you as a teacher, you need to step in um, and basically make the kids apologize. If they some, do something goofy, oftentimes kids know that anyway, and they themselves will say sorry. Um, so it's all good. Try to remain courteous uh, in the face of hostility or anger. Yes, be polite. Don't get angry. No, no tooth for tooth and eye for an eye type deal. Treat all students respectfully and politely, obviously. Be an attentive listener. Listen to what they have to say. If they have something to say, then listen to them. Um, you know, unless you know the students and unless you know that they are a sly little, little bugger, um, and try to weasel their way out of responsibilities, um, then, you know, pay attention to that. I had a student in my class in England, again, in public school. Um, she was disruptive all the time. And, and I, would, 
I would take her aside and talk to her and say, listen, can you please not do that? It's very disruptive and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she would say, yes, I understand. And this is my problem. And she would tell me things, you know, from like problems she was dealing with at home. And I would feel like, yo, man, I would sympathize with her and and be understand, I would understand her. And so I thought we had a rapport. And then literally, you know, next class, it was back to the same thing. So sometimes you just like, you, you know. Uh, model the behavior you expect from your students. If you want students to be polite, be polite. You know, if you want students to not run across the hallways, then you shouldn't run across the hallways yourself. Uh, specifically describe misbehavior and help students understand the consequences of misbehavior. And when you're dealing with younger kids, um, oftentimes they may not be able to understand what it is that they did wrong. So explain to them what it is that they wrong. Uh, they did wrong. Uh, and just remind them of the expectations. Again, if you have stuff written down on the board, it helps a lot. Be aware of cultural differences. For example, a student who stares um, at the floor while you speak to him or her would be viewed as defiant in some cultures and respectful in others. Yes, uh, it's true. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, not looking at me while I'm talking to you is not necessarily for all cultures. And maybe so in the Western society, but not necessarily in a lot of the Eastern societies. Discourage uh, clicks and other antisocial behavior. So basically bull bullying, you know, make sure that doesn't happen in your classroom. Uh, so like don't single students out for doing something wrong. Um, and if, uh, you know, if you point, if there's a kid who's acting up and you're trying to stop it, make sure that there's no other kids kind of like, you know, bunching up and saying, yeah, don't do that. You shouldn't have done that. Because that's not what you want. That just makes things even worse. Teach students academic survival skills. No idea what that means. Let's pass that up. Avoid labeling students as good or bad. Like you're a bad student, you're a good student. Focus on encouraging and a rewarding acceptable behavior. Yes. Ignore or minimize minor problems instead of disrupting the class. Yes. If there's something small, just don't focus on it too much, you know. Uh, ignore. Um, where reprimands are necessary, state them quickly and without disrupting the class. Yes. Finally, when it's necessary to speak to student about his or her behavior, try to speak in private. If you have a student with some major issues, some major problems, um, talk to them after class, talk to them separately. Uh, it probably is a lot better because the student will feel, not feel like they're being watched and listened to. And you might be able to establish a better rapport with the student, maybe talk to them a bit more and find out what the problem is, why they can't sit still or whatever. Um, and you might be able to actually, you know, have a better way of controlling that. Um, if you do have a student whose English is good and they just get bored very easily, then I would suggest to, to take that opportunity to make that student into your teacher's helper and use that student to be the guide rather than the, you know, the scapegoat. Um, if there is a student who's active um, and wants to be active, then maybe you could use them to help you out and like be the leader of the class and put them on a pedestal at certain times not not always but you know use use that kind of dynamic to or student teacher to help you out in some cases right okay well that's it i think it's been what are we at 40 minutes um i think i would like to conclude it with that um because i think 40 minutes is plenty of time um thank you all for listening i hope this information was useful um, and if it wasn't, feel free to drop me a comment below the video um, and let me know what it is that you would like to add. If there is any other, if there are any other points that you would like to add to this little uh, talk, if there there's things that I missed um, that I didn't talk about but should have had, please make sure to leave a comment in the comment section below. Um, and other than that, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, Joe Boomer. Thanks, man, for sticking around, for coming down. Um, and another person, who was it? Mm, let me check here in the comment section. Ah, uh, so Hyung Sung, thank you for coming around. Uh, if you are watching this podcast after its recording day, day uh, time, make sure to watch the whole thing till the end. Um, so you probably don't hear this thing that I'm saying. If you did watch the whole thing till the end, fantastic. Hit the subscribe button, like the video, and we will see you next week.
I'm working on getting uh, another speaker on the show, uh, you know, to have a nice chat with. So make sure to come back next week. Doodle do. Doodle do. Alrighty. Once again, thank you all for coming. Um, hope you enjoyed this 40 minutes with me. Uh, the, the, the Korea podcast, the only podcast that's live on YouTube, streaming live from South Korea. Uh, make sure to come back here next week. And here's a little outro that is not going to be uh, copyrighted. Have a good one. Have a good weekend. Have a good week, rather. And we'll see you in the next podcast next week, next Monday. Bye-bye.